Oh, I see 30 people have entered. That's good. Give this another. So this is the very, very beginning here. We're just getting started. I'll let, I'll wait another minute or two for people to join. And you can watch the infinite feedback of video fall into, into infinity. Pretty good turnouts for almost 50 people. It's good. Okay, why don't I go ahead and get started? So what I'm gonna be doing is, I'm trying to do a little bit of an experiment. So uh, uh, last year, when I, I spoke at this conference, uh, you'll, first of all, you'll notice in the far right, there's a, there's a little um, a column there with, with lights on it. Uh, and last year, when I presented this conference, I had that uh, with me and I had built a little, what I called a virtual, virtual turnstile. And essentially, what I did is I, I used that to kind of keep track of people that were visiting our booth. And I, I had a story around how that was using APIs. And I, and I wanted to do something sort of interesting this year as well. Uh, hopefully as interesting as what I did last year was. And so I thought I would try to reuse some of that and I would build kind of an interactive app. And so what you're gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go through my whole presentation here in a minute. And then at the end, I'm gonna end it with a demo. Um, but, but I thought I would let people get started now if they wanted to. Um, and so basically there's a QR code there that's gonna take you to a, Super, super simple, oh, I see someone's hit it. <laughs> uh, super, super simple uh, application that's gonna let you choose colors. And as, as you guys in the audience pick more and more colors, um, it's gonna rearrange itself in different ways. And so that, that application looks like this. And as I said, I can already see, you can see the lights kind of blinking there on the right, and it's choosing different things. So if I go and I choose blue a couple times, um, then you're gonna see the blue here on the right, it's gonna make up more of the percentage of what that actually is. And this is the application all of you guys have access to. Uh, I, in turn, have my own version of it, which is a little different because I have the power to wipe all that out. Uh, so I can <laughs> reset it back to white um, uh, so that it, uh, it comes back to that again anytime I want. But there, I can see even though I did that, you guys were already managed to hit it a couple times. Anyway, and I'm going to use this to kind of weave a ecosystem story, external versus internal APIs, uh, which we'll see at the end. And I, I will return to those uh, to those links again, so there'll be an opportunity for people to look at that again if they're really interested in that. Okay, but I'll let that kind of sit here on the right. And you guys can see that throughout the rest of my presentation. Okay, so the spread of COVID-19 is, uh, I wanna make the argument, is a kind of a, uh, a crisis of kind of big data proportions. And we're supposed to be in this age of assistance today. And I, I kind of wanna ask the question if we really, really are, right? Um, and and I'll, I'll point to the fact of how we're all looking for new ways to innovate, new ways to kind of run these types of presentations at this point um, by virtue of the fact of the situation that we're in with the pandemic. For a long time, we've delivered value in terms of this thing that we call the digital value chain. And that's been or a normal value chain, which has been this kind of series of events where we start from the left and start building, uh, building things and move toward the right in a linear progression. And the aim has always been to kind of optimize those steps to make them as efficient as possible so they add more and more value. But at some point, that value chain began to get disrupted. And that's been going on for quite a long time. And here's a bunch of different um, names that I'm sure everybody will recognize, Uber and Airbnb and Netflix and Facebook, and Google itself, uh, which have kind of disrupted that value chain, notably by kind of changing whether or not it moves in a linear progression or not, right? So, so Uber is an application that connects producers with subscribers, right? It, it connects people that really want to drive people around with people who really want to get a lift somewhere. 
And that's a really powerful thing. And that's driven entirely off APIs. Facebook doesn't make its own content. It allows me to make content and share it with other people and other people to like my content and to read my content and so on. So all these things have been disrupted by, by the power of these APIs. And that has significant impacts on overall market uh, market cap. So if I look at companies like BMW versus Uber again, you'll see when they were founded, their overall market cap, the number of employees they have and so on. We can see that despite the significant a lack of employees uh, and the you know years since existence, Uber is worth a tremendous amount of money. And in spite of that, they're losing money. But uh, but uh, that notwithstanding, they still have a significant market end gap. And and that's important and interesting because it tells us something about the power of these APIs and how they kind of change the rules of this value chain. And they change it in a way that kind of turns it into something that starts to look more like a platform. And we think, you know, from where I, from my point of view, from, from Apogee, that this really is the goal of, or should be the goal of any system that's based on APIs and based on modernizing, is you want to take those APIs, that API team, and try, kind of create an ecosystem that attracts developers um, and, and make that a platform uh, that can extend into that ecosystem. And that, that means that you can enrich your brand experience. It also gives you the optionality to decide to not focus on your brand experience. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Um, kind of double or triple or your, your overall revenue of your company and create a system of reuse that's kind of core and part and parcel to that whole platform experience. So, but what's an ecosystem? So I wanna spend a moment on this. Um, and, I, and I did some research to kind of look up what ecosystems mean and where they come from. And there's a, you'll see here, I've, I've listed a, a number of different players. Um, and I want to focus actually on the second name there. So G. Evelyn Hutchinson. So he was a limnologist. And, and that basically means that he was a, a man who studied lakes. And he studied lakes primarily in the New England area. He actually is kind of the father of ecosystem, but didn't actually coin the term. There's somebody else coined it for him. One of the other names there, actually. And but what his basis of study was on just following these lakes to kind of see how life in the lake versus life outside the lake changed. And what he found was that the more energy that went into that lake, the greater the overall amount of algae that you would find in that lake. And as that algae in the lake increased, so did the fauna in the lake. So you'd see more and more fish um, and more and more plant life. And then as that grew inside the lake, so did the fauna around the lake. So there'd be more and more creatures, more and more plant life and everything that grew around that lake. And in years where there was less overall energy input into the lake, so too did you have less um, variability and, 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 and overall volumes of, of fauna and flora, you know, in, both inside and outside that lake. And I really do think that's the story of what we're looking for with APIs is that we want to take these APIs and use them in a way so we create an ecosystem that not only makes it easy for us to engage internally and to find those internal use cases that are going to help us grow and help us innovate and help us change, but also create, you know, kind of something at the edge, like at the edge of a lake, that's going to allow external forces to come in and pump more and more energy into that system and derive more and more value out of it on their own right. And if we control that, if we own that ecosystem, then what we've really done is we've created the kind of type of platform. And it's that platform that's beginning to also be researched in interesting ways. So this is an idea of the platform index. And basically, some research was done to look at different companies that had really focused on becoming a platform business and then compare them with a couple of other indices that we know from the market. So here you can see it's a comparison with the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, the DAX 30. And these companies follow the same trends as those that are on these other indices, but significantly outperform them. Right, and it's this idea of becoming a platform business by actually focusing on that ecosystem to kind of make that happen. All that, or all those API interactions create significant data, and they, and they create significant data that can help drive us uh, on our decision-making abilities in terms of what's happening today and what'll probably happen tomorrow. And so I wanna introduce the notion of um, survivorship bias. So this is a gentleman named uh, Abraham Walt. He uh, was originally from modern day uh, modern day Romania from Cluj Napoca. In his time, it was Hungarian, uh, it was a Hungarian area. And he fled the Austro Hungarian Empire to the US to join the war effort um, in order to fight, uh, fight Germany um, or fight the Axis during uh, World War II. He contributed greatly to decision theory, geometry, economic, uh, economic, econometrics, and he kind of founded the field of statistical sequential analysis. And notably, he was put to task to kind of take all this data that the Army at the time, because at this point in time, the, the U.S. didn't have its own Air Force. So the Army was providing him data on aircraft 
so army run aircraft and the Royal Air Force run aircraft that were going down during battles. And they, they were handing him this data that looked like this, like you see here. And he was told, go find out the best place to armor these planes statistically. Now we don't wanna armor them too much. If we encumber them with too much weight, they'll become actually even less maneuverable than they already are. And that lack of maneuverability will also mean that they're easier to shoot down and they'll go down even more often. So we need you to find that sweet spot where you're gonna kind of make get the most bang for the buck, so to speak. And what he found and his, his counter back, back to the, these army intelligence officers was that actually you wanna put the armor where you don't see any bullet holes at all. And this caused a rift and there was some discussions back and forth, but he ultimately won out because he could prove that this is the data. The data is in fact inclusive of a whole bunch of aircraft that I know aren't in your data because I happen to know that there's a bunch of data, uh, aircraft that never made it back. And that means that those hidden planes themselves are part of the data set that you weren't providing me. And I wanna make the argument that, you know, not everything is as simple as kind of down bombers, right? So, so th there's a bunch of COVID uh, disruptions that are happening all over the world, hot spots that rise and fall. And this affects and makes predictability in terms of supply chains and in terms of how we're gonna run a business really, really difficult but actually we could be collecting more and more of this data and we could be grabbing all this data by virtue of APIs because those APIs at the edge of a lake, if you will, or inside the lake collect all of these interaction points and we could use them to derive more and more information um, that kind of help us drive what I might call a virtuous cycle. So we can imagine if you've got a, a number of different types, a number of different types of users that are interacting with our API system, partners, internal developers, uh, third party developers, and they ultimately are consuming an API that itself creates a new channel of data. That API data then can have its own machine learning algorithms run upon it. We can take existing data and run those machine learning uh, algorithms on it. And that again can be exposed in a virtuous cycle that creates a constant loop. And if we do that properly, then maybe we can get a little closer to this idea of age of assistance and actually really begin to build on what we think those principles really ought to mean. So Google's network today receives over 10 billion API calls every second. And that is equivalent to a very, 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 very large number. I, I wanna say when I looked at this the last time, it was 86 quadrillion. I think that might be actually one of our, but 86 quadrillion, 400 uh, trillion calls per day. So and a, a simply massive number of API calls that are coming in all the time. And with this data, they're able to derive all kinds of interesting bits of information. And that in turn creates new APIs, which creates this kind of virtuous cycle. So Google is an example of a company that's doing this in real life. So in order, if we're doing this properly and we're kind of feeding this ecosystem and creating these platforms of interaction, then really what we're doing is we're beginning to treat developers as the actual customers that we most care about. And the idea here really is that every developer could hold the key to creating the next big thing that's gonna be super important for your organization or your enterprise. And a lot of people want a, some kind of way to reach them. And so the most common way to do that, of course, is a developer portal. So we wanna make it easy to access uh, well-documented APIs. We wanna implement the 555 rule. And if you're, you're not familiar with that, that's this idea that it should take no more than five seconds to find an API and five minutes to kind of start testing with it. And then five hours, maybe five days uh, to take the first real application using that API into production. Um, and then uh, with all of this, you wanna build a community with blogs and forums, frequently asked questions so that you provide your own feedback loop both for the people that are running the API program to reach out to the developers, the customers of your API, but also provide a way for uh, those customers to, to speak and learn from each other. Because a great thing about building a proper ecosystem, if you run that ecosystem, is that um, these players begin to interact with each other without your direct involvement. And just like they would in nature, right? So uh, as that, as that energy, psych, energy kind of, uh, interaction point increases, so do the amount of players that can feed on that and, and produce and, and put their own energy back into it in, in their own right. You want to invest in API evangelism. This is the idea of kind of creating a marketplace for them, and not just in terms of the portal, but also developer conferences, participate in these message boards, and you want to kind of convince your developers on adoption. So create a very clear value proposition, so a market for them, and provide tooling that makes this very easy to use. And then again, as I said before, kind of create those feedback loops uh, so that it feels like a, a larger and larger and more gauged, engaged platform uh, for them to take part in. And then monitor the performance. So keep track of where you're seeing things succeed, where you're not getting information. As, as I mentioned before, we have these challenges now in this pandemic that I'd like to think 
or to some extent could be solved by, vir by virtue of a greater API ecosystem because it would give us the kind of monitoring capability that we're lacking to a very large extent today. Uh, and doing this means that also that we can protect against abuse. We can also reinforce those patterns that really are working um, uh, to our benefit um, and, and, and basically just kind of tell us how to kind of make this work for the long haul. Um, a note on championing the, the business value. So you want to define the right KPIs. So hopefully it's part of any API program that you create that's kind of feeding back into this ecosystem. You're going to define some KPIs that connect consumption back to revenue, customer experience, growth, and kind of the speed of partner onboarding. And th this partner onboarding aspect is something that's super important and something that we've seen a lot in our, in our own interactions with customers is that um, very often onboarding is a sluggish process and a manual process that requires a lot of actual paperwork. But the moment that you can start making that work faster, the more quickly those partners can work on your behalf. And, and that, that means that you're gonna see some speed to, to agility and speed back to profitability kind of increase. And you can measure that with the right KPIs and then reinforce, again, those same patterns there that really are working for you. Manage iteration, so you wanna be able to kind of plan when you're gonna upgrade these APIs and do performance testing, look at when performance is suffering because you don't have the right call set up, learn when your developers are requiring additional features, and, and overall productize these and think about how you're gonna iterate these products just like you would any other real products that you'd be running. If you can, you wanna monetize. Now, a lot of, a lot of our customers uh, want to come to Apogee because they hope to take their APIs and services, perhaps their data, and they wanna draw dollar signs on them and immediately turn a profit. And it's actually not usually that, that easy, but when you hit the point where you've got an established set of players um, feeding on the services that you guys have created, if you can monetize that APIs, then um, you, you can actually kind of get direct payback for all the efforts you put into that. And there's different models for that. So you can offer freemium models that are going to allow easy access to these APIs in the near term, and then over, term, over time begin to demand, um, you know, uh, payment uh, in order to continue use of them. Freemium versus bronze versus silver versus gold models are another option, pre and post base, but overall kind of uh, focus on that monetization value, including maybe even revenue sharing, where you're encouraging that developer ecosystem to take advantage of the APIs you're offering and you're gonna give them a kickback um, in return for using it. Okay, so we've talked about kind of product, you know, product and platforms and ecosystems, that that creates a significant amount of data and, and kind of how to engage these developers and keep them involved in your, in your system that you've created for them. So now what? So we think that ecosystems could account for more than $60 trillion of revenue by 2025. It actually comes from McKinsey and company, or that's more than 30% of global corporate revenue. It's a significant amount of money. Um, and, and we think to capture that really, you need to think about any kind of digital journey that you might embark upon, like entering a foreign market. So, if you're going to go into a foreign market, there's going to be a lot of things to consider. So there's cultural differences, language, ethnicity, religion, kind of social networks and social biases, a bunch of significant administrative differences that could be, you know, of great import to how you're going to do business, how you do human resourcing, border problems, time zone differences, significant legal differences in terms of, of how uh, any of these issues work not to mention the geographic differences uh, that, that might be vastly different. So there's a bunch of considerations that are of great import before you decide to take any business into a whole new geography. And we think that actually taking your digital business efforts and, and moving them from however you're doing them today in, into a new platform uh, or into a new ecosystem is very much like trying to decide to do business in a foreign country. And that means there's a bunch of different focuses, right? So you might have a focus on a needing to adapt a couple of your products as opposed to taking every product in your portfolio and running after those um, as, as one of the first ventures you do. You want to design around that cost of adaptation. In particular, you want to partition different types of services into global versus maybe local elements and modularize them so that you can create new packaged product versions that might be more efficient in this format, in this form factor for this digital audience versus perhaps a brick and mortar audience that you were you know, uh, working for before, or maybe just a partner only audience. You wanna externalize these and reduce the internal burden of kind of adaptation to make that easier to use for external parties. And finally, you wanna innovate. And I, I wanna say maybe more importantly, you wanna make this innovation happen as quickly as possible. 
So if I take this view and I apply an API lens to it, then we might say that we want to focus on one or two products for an initial market entry and maybe one or two segments as far as that's concerned. Again, we're going to design um, you know, and have a focus on this design. So let's assume an API first approach. So we'll have this, this API first approach where we modularize these services to reduce this internal cost. That means that we can externalize them in a way. So we can create new product mappings around how we've taken these services and, uh, and offered them to new external markets. And all that together means that we can innovate, right? So we, this API first approach means that we can very, uh, very quickly take agile, new, innovative approaches to designing new packets and formations of these um, and, and parent those with new business models. Not to mention the fact that we can simply just keep spinning that same uh, some iterative cycle in terms of how we develop them. Um, your API strategy and your brand need to be aligned. Now, I mentioned before I was going to mention something about this, and this isn't this isn't religion, but this is something that I think that everybody who's beginning to to, to work in this kind of platform mindset needs to really think about when, when they when they decide to go to market in this way. So evolve your thinking about this. So um, oftentimes there's this approach that the brand is the end all be all of everything that you're doing, and while we certainly don't want to tell people they should abandon their brand altogether, I do think it's important to kind of think about where these costs are. So you'll, you'll see here under this marketplace, there's this idea of having a popularity versus overall products, right? So you're gonna, your brand might begin as something very, very strongly attached to how your core business is running. And over time, as your product reach and your service reach kind of expands, you might not have that same brand affinity in each and every one of those types of interactions. And I'll just, to make a point of this, uh, mention this customer of ours. This is D, uh, DBS. They're one of the top 100 ASEAN uh, banks, 2011 to 2019. And they essentially decided that in order to have a broader reach and, and to have the impact that they were really wanted to get uh, in terms of this kind of ecosystem approach, they were going to give up that brand. So they were going to become a bank that was that was part and parcel of a whole bunch of transactions that were happening for commerce, for perhaps for loans, perhaps for um, different types of account aggregation and so forth. They were gonna broaden that reach so they could become the force that was gonna make these things happen, but they were gonna do so by stepping away from the brand. So they could perhaps, if they, if they were gonna do, for example, an account aggregation uh, point of view, they might become the ecosystem platform that was gonna make that work even for banks that weren't their own, so that you could gather the st these different types of information and data and pull them together to offer a new service, but do that while creating a whole, while supplying those as services that somebody else was gonna present the data without them owning it themselves. And that meant that their reach and their overall market impact grew significantly, but they did so while stepping away, at least for those interactions, from their own brand. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't keep their brand for their own retail, or perhaps some of the corporate banking scenarios, but they created a new area where they could have this kind of ecosystem impact uh, without doing so. And uh, we see this sometimes be very, very effective for, for a lot of large, large organizations. And it's something to definitely consider in terms of this kind of digital ecosystems play. Any given API can have a whole bunch of different types of payoffs, right? So. Um, you might create an API that you think is going to drive the kind of data, this data system. You're going to create data, you're going to create data input channels, and you're going to maybe even marketize or monetize that data. But sometimes uh, that itself will create more interactions. Um, that'll spread by word of mouth. So you get your partners through that. That, that means you can lead to developer pays um, uh, interactions as opposed to internal um, interactions. So any any one type of API setup might in fact grow to a whole bunch of different types of outcomes. And so there's never underestimate the, the, the types of payoffs and the opportunities you're going to get in terms of any of these third-party customer journeys. And the APIs that, that begin perhaps as something that you're using internally very quickly can be externalized if you can productize them in a way. And again, that ecosystem play, right? So you can take something that largely is something internal and make it externalizable in a way means that it can grow and have significant impacts. And now I want to switch to talk a little bit about a pizza company. So it's like a pizza company that uh, is, is in fact a customer of ours. I'm not going to name uh, who they are, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about kind of their own digital transformation journey that they took uh, with us a couple of years ago. So they're one of the largest in the world, over 16,000. Actually, I think actually that number's grown, um, but uh, locations in 85 different countries uh, and significant gross sales uh, back in 2018. 
2018 Accelerator of the Year, 15 different digital ordering services, and of course, 65% of sales are done now via these digital ordering channels. And so you might ask yourselves, you know, what kind of company is this? Well, they make pizza, they, they run these stores, these stores all have pizza ovens in them. There's a bit of a logistics problem as they've kind of designed their own uh, facilities around to, transform, uh, to, to, to uh, transport these different ingredients uh, to all these different locations. There's significant HR overhead. In short, you might think that they're a physical world kind of brick and mortar institution that makes pizzas. But in fact, they think of themselves as a digital company because they've opened up all these different channels. And since they've done this, they've seen a 117% increase in overall revenue. 65% of all their sales, as I said, both here and on my last slide, are now done digitally. And now they've created 20 different ways that you can order a pizza, including a 75% of international markets kind of featuring this kind of method of online ordering. And that means that, that, that they've taken something that would arguably just have been an internal based system, you know, where for, for creating these pizzas and for creating the menus, and they've opened it up to a system where people can have their own impact. In fact, they've created their own AI scanner so they can scan any, any given pizza and you can use that to kind of feed into a system of, of image recognitions for these pizzas, uh, which they can use to create their own data channel in terms of future pizzas they wanna make, perhaps um, a way to identify a pizza so you can order one that you see somebody else eating if you like that and so on. That creates a whole new fleet of services they would never have had otherwise and that you could clearly never have in terms of a traditional brick and mortar type institution. And, and, and with that, I'm, I'm gonna switch back uh, to kind of looking at the little lights there that I see haven't blinked for a while, so I think people have stopped touching it. I'm gonna go ahead and reset it. So if I, if I click delete all of it, it should wipe out, and then a few seconds it should, there it goes. It detects that there's been a change and it goes back to white. And to kick it started, I'll go ahead and hit blue, um, and it should turn blue here in just a second. Um, Maybe I hit green, hit red, hit blue. Or maybe it's having trouble hitting my own service now. In which case, I will reset it. And let's talk a little bit about what I have here and what these, what these lights are really doing and what the whole story is here behind this. So essentially, I have a couple of products. I've got a, a colors product for the enterprise a colors mesh external product, and then I've got a, an external mesh APIs product that kind of are, is a mapping for everything that I'm running internally. And what this is, this external mesh service is basically mapping to a Kubernetes service uh, ingress point where I'm running uh, the, the microservice that's actually affecting all this. So I've got a microservice that's, that's kind of reading and writing to a MongoDB hosted internally. Um, and that service, I'm actually of allowing carte blanche access to it, is uh, where I've got a color service that allows me to read the colors that are that are currently set, and then it spits them back in percentages, and the ability to write them back in terms of red, green, and blue. And then as I as I click more and more red, green, and blue, it'll adjust the offsets of those uh, accordingly. The colors product uh, enterprise is using an API proxy called colors. This is a, a proxy that I'm running on Apigee Edge. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. And this, this is the service that the box itself is actually using to communicate back. Then I've got a colors mesh external, wait, whoops, colors, uh, this one, using the API, API days colors proxy, which is the one that application, this app is actually using, is using that one. And I've, I've separated them that way so I can have two different types of concerns. That's what allows me to have ultimately a system like this where any, anybody can choose a color versus a system like this, which also gives me an admin feature where everything's really based on the same backend service. Both of these servers are consuming them, but I'm exposing them in different ways through my API proxy. So if I jump now to API proxies and we go and we look at my API days colors, And I'll just jump over here to develop. What I've done is I've got a very simple verify API key. I've got a quota in there should I decide to enable a quota. In fact, when I was initially doing this, I thought I might do that. I've, I think I believe I've turned that off. And I've got something here to add cores. You can see I've disabled deletes entirely. So I'm not allowing people from the general audience to come in and kind of delete all, all the colors that I have stored in my database, but it is otherwise running. And if I move over here to trace 
and I start a trace session, then I should be able to cause some traffic uh, to come hit it. So with that running, I should be able to jump here, hit red, green, blue, jump back, and I can say, oh, I'm getting a 500 error. So I'm, I'm hit, actually having a problem communicating with my back end at this point. Oh, my quota is overrun. So I've, I've managed to overrun my quota. I thought I disabled that, but apparently my quota is still active. So I can, what I'll do is I'll stop this trace session, move back, and I'm gonna open up this quota for absolutely everybody so that it's no longer causing us any issues. So I'll hit false for that. Save. Go back to trace. And now it's green, right? Someone's managed to hit a color on that. If I go and do the same now, I'm going to go make sure I'm not, not also likewise doing so for my other proxy. I've got another version of this, the colors proxy. As I said, this is the one that the box itself is using. So every three seconds, it's querying back, asking to see if there's any updates or anything it needs to do for its own. What I'm going to go do is make sure that I disable that quota as well and save that. And every time it updates, it's because that box has discovered that someone's made a change and that it needs to update. And if it turns white, it's because it's had some kind of trouble uh, connecting back to that back end. There. So you see it turned white briefly while I was affecting it, but now it's running back again. So people are still hitting it. And I'm still getting different choices there and all that's running. And as, I, as this runs, I'm kind of gathering different types of information. So if I jump to publish and I go and I look at, uh, sorry, if I go to analyze and I go and I look at API metrics and my API proxy performance, I'm gonna get a breakdown of where I'm seeing this traffic and the type of traffic that's coming in. So I can see there's a whole bunch of traffic coming out on API Days Colors. You can see that there's a bunch of traffic going to my Kubernetes service, the Dev API Evil Sim service. And I've got a lot of, you know, a constant stream of traffic coming in for the box itself. So again, colors, this yellow line is the box itself and when it's doing its queries, the blue one is all the traffic that I'm getting otherwise. And I'm getting tremendous amounts. So you you guys in the audience really are hitting the heck out of it, <laughs> which is good. That's why I wanted, that's probably why I overran the, it's good that I, I went ahead and disabled that quota. So the, and if I if I furthermore kind of break this down in terms of developers and look at my developer engagement, then I should see something interesting as well. So here I can see there's an external app. This is the one that's actually, this is actually Apigee itself as it enters my ingress, my Kubernetes service. I'm using this to kind of control access at the microservice level versus the API day audience app versus the, the appliance itself. Obviously, this one is kind of a—it's kind of the combination of both this and these two kind of together, and this is why you see significant. This not set as uh, being used to kind of mediate traffic between my my mesh service and everything that I'm running uh, here this way. But but by by taking these same API sources, I'm able to use them and repurpose them in kind of different ways. So uh, and, and and then by publishing them in two different kind of productized versions, I can keep track of them from an analytics perspective in terms of where it's being used one way and where it's being used another. And this is uh, also true for error code analysis. So if I go and look at error codes, I saw that I had a bunch of quota problems earlier. So there should be um, significant errors in terms of yeah. So I've got all kinds of 500 errors that were coming in, uh, no doubt because my quotas were being overrun. And of course, total errors, but in terms of target errors. And I can break that down by proxy. So if I want to see only the ones for for this particular search use case, and I can see here they started to increase significantly <laughs> uh, right around the time that I started this uh, I started this call today with you guys. That's when I began to see all these errors. Um, and but for in terms of target errors, in terms of Apogee's own uh, issues reaching to where I'm also managing this traffic and sort of my mesh, there I've hardly seen anything at all. I, I've had virtually no issues whatsoever. And of course, you can see I was getting all kinds of 403 and 500 errors. 403 would be RBAC errors in terms of uh, the wrong key, using it to access it. Or also, um, I am rate limiting uh, the traffic coming into the Kubernetes cluster as well. So if one of you guys in the audience managed to pick apart my very, very simple view application and really peg it, then you could be sending all kinds of traffic there as well in that way. Okay, um, that's it from, in terms of what I had planned for simple demo and uh, some kind of ecosystem discussion. I hope that was useful. I'm gonna go switch back here now and stop sharing and see if you guys 
have any questions for me. Oh, I see you guys couldn't really see my screen. That's too bad. Hmm. Uh, there was a question, what was the name of the site I used to manage the API? That was Apogee. Can I elaborate on the key five steps? Do you mean the 555 rule? It was uh, Barbara Fluga that asked me about the key five steps. I want to make sure I understand which, if those are the five, if that's what you mean. I assume that's what you mean. No, from the business need uh, to execution. The, so, in the business need to execution. So there's this idea that you're going to take something that's, that's business powered and kind of move it so you can execute on it. Um, and you might have a different, a number of different steps uh, to do that. Um, let me see. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly which slide you're referring to for that. But suffice it to say, in order to take any any business need that you have today and turn it into something that's going to be API powered and kind of ecosystem powered, um, you want to begin by by making these things that are, are an internal only problem something that's accessible to external parties as well. So begin kind of kind of the way you know that uh, Amazon did years years ago back with the Bezos mandate. Think in an API first perspective and make sure that you can take those things that are only useful inside your own your own business domain inside your own uh, cordoned off piece of where you're actually active and open it up to the community around you so that people around you can get access to them. That'll kind of create a, a, a resource need so you can kind of build integrations between those systems. As those integrations build, you can kind of transform how they're being active and then productize those so they're no longer active only in their own resident internal piece that can begin to be offered externally as well. And as those external uh, forces that were only, began with something that was only internally available, now you can fundamentally transform what you're doing at all. And, and I'll point, I'll, I'll point again to an organization like Amazon, right, which began as a service that was selling books to a service that was using that same uh, platform that they had built uh, to 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 only to sell things more than books that they used to say that this system that we're now using to sell random or almost any kind of retail item. We can build that to uh, to create an, an ecosystem that other players can come in and use that. And by the way, the hosting prowess that we built around this, we can offer that as a web service in its own right that we can sell as a cloud player. How do you manage all the APIs and keep them up to date? Um, so I it, for, for today's presentation, I didn't I didn't really touch on that. I, I did offer. In the in the presentation I had, there was a GitHub link to my own GitHub repo. You guys are welcome to it for for all that code. But essentially, I'd say there's a couple of steps in terms of how to manage APIs uh, from that perspective. One is, as I I think you should productize your API. So what you guys saw me do today in a very quick Apogee demo was I had an API proxy. It did the actual work. And I had kind of two different versions of that proxy. I had one that was available for external use cases and I had one that was internal specific that allowed kind of more uh, admin access directly to those. That's one. Two, the productization of them themselves gave me the ability to, to create quotas around them. So if I wanted to do different types of quota enforcement for different types of products, I had that ability to do that then uh, in, in a way that makes it easier. Three, I'd say there's a there's a there's always a, a, a big part of any management perspective, discussion on APIs around versioning, which is a, a super big topic. And thankfully, um, depending on which 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 way you want to go in terms of versioning. I'm very partial to versioning in APIs, uh, URLs. Um, and not everybody agrees, but mainly because it's it's how we actually use our specifications today. It, 
that's how they work. Open API specifications work in terms of methods and paths. And that means that if we version that way, then we can create multiple versions of our APIs. In Apache terms, those will become different types of API proxies. And I can create different productized versions of those proxies along the way as well. And they can be lined up to different versions in a way that's clean. And all of that can be pulled back into an automated CI CD system so that you can manage all of it and connect it directly to whatever your backends are. Uh, I, I don't know if if that was that's okay. Good. I think those are all the questions so far. I sorry about the you guys that you guys couldn't see everything. I had widened it all the way out to my full screen, but I wanted to try to find a way to get the blinky lights in, uh, and and the blinky lights in, and then keep you know along with the rest of my presentation. Ascendant. Ascendant compatible API. I'm not sure what that means. Sorry, can you? Thoughts of what organizations need to do to change to adopt an API first mindset. Ooh. <clears throat> um. Yeah, first of all, let's talk about what an API first mindset is. I, th I think a lot of people think that an API first mindset is just, oh, you build the API before you build your web application or before you you build whatever whatever consuming type of application you want to build. I think it's a lot more than that. Um, building building API first means that before anyone starts writing the producing code, ideally instead of using annotations in your uh, in your in your Java applications um, in order to in order to generate a bunch of spec design work, you, uh, the producer, and whoever is going to actually ultimately be consuming this application uh, API, should sit down and think about the design pattern, the design flow, of what that's going to look like, and make that the version one of that Open API specification. And that that is Open API specification should be a contract, and and that contract. And that, that contract forms the basis that everything's going to work on from there out. Just like a contract would in the real world between a buyer and a seller, this provides a, a, an interface that everyone's going to agree on to get started. From there, that becomes your version one. Producers can begin producing the service, and the consumers can, been, can begin uh, creating their initial version that's going to consume that API. Now, the business. How do you get the business um, in, involved in that? You have to find a way to convince the business that there's going to be money here. And we, we see that the, the largest and most successful API implementations that really work are those that really have a business mandate, where the business players are directly measured on the success and failure of the API programs, and, are, and where it's not just an adjunct or a plug-in to the rest of those business. And you need that because APIs need to happen fast. So I opened up by saying that API first isn't just about doing the API before you build the app. It's, it should be about really embracing that, that contract between the, the consumer and the producer. Um, I, I think, I think what, you, what you really want is that type of conversation to be as easy to have as possible. And so also that you can learn from your mistakes. So you're going to fail sometimes when you build these APIs. You need to very quickly be able to move from version one to version two and or see the successes of your first of your first API and then copy on that to build your next your next follow up versions to kind of make that work. Um, what is a platform business? So a a a platform business is a business that that's basically creates a platform. And I'll give you a, an example to think about in terms of this. Uh, imagine any business that starts off doing any one thing and then decides to own own the 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 capabilities uh, that they use to deliver the thing that they were selling before, um, and now open it up to players, even even to competition. Uh, you see this all the time. At both the company I work for, uh, where, where, where you know Google uh, will run something uh, as a as a cloud business uh, in order to empower other players to come back and compete with what they're doing themselves. Amazon does this as, as well. When I've mentioned Amazon Web Services all the time, um, in terms of how they started at something, they, they, they create a platform that allows other players to come and host on themselves so that they own the platform for which this type of business is taking place. That to me is a, is a, is a platform business. And a proper platform business is one that is engaged in ecosystems. And ideally, it is engaged in ecosystems so it's as easy as possible for new and new players to come and partake in that ecosystem by onboarding to that platform. So you want to make that as simple as possible. Uh, 
sure. Did I? I wonder if I if I finished answering the API first mindset question. Um, I I guess I did. What's the five 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 rule for developer? The, the 555 rule is is simply and then whether it there's different permutations, but whether it's five seconds, five minutes, five days, or five hours. But the idea is in virtually no time at all, any developer should be able to come and find an API. Uh, and and then in virtually no time at all after that, so five seconds, I should be able to find the API I want on your API on your developer portal. In five minutes, I should be already capable of getting my own access to that API and testing it out, ideally in the developer portal to see how it works. And then in five days, I should be able to take what I've learned from that initial interaction and build something that's actually doing something interesting with that API. And, and I'll give you I'll give you an example of this where this has had real life impact for me. So I was building. I was building a lab a couple of years ago for uh, based on Node.js and using Apigee. And I wanted to build a directions API, that's an example, that gave me weather updates along the way, just to kind of build an example that I could offer to people in a lab setting. And I thought, since I work at Google, I will go and I will use the Google API, uh, the, the Google Maps uh, API to kind of make this possible. And I abandoned it back then. I, I've got a new version of it. You doing that? But I abandoned it back then because it was actually harder to use than uh, than the another API I found that was going to do the same thing. Uh, and and that's that's exactly how that five 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 rule works. I spent five seconds trying to use the Google Maps API and realized that I was going to have to go create a special account in order to do that. And even though I was going to be using it for free, I had to offer credit card details in order to use it. And it wasn't clear how I was going to log in and do it. And so I went, okay, I'm going to spend just one minute looking somewhere else to see if I could find another way to do this. Very quickly found another API that was 100% free, that had easy examples that I could copy and paste into curl in about two seconds, switched immediately. Moved everything over to using that because it was going to be easier for me to create and easier for me to offer it as a lab, and I walked away from it. That's lost interaction. That's a lost customer to, to that API, and I work for Google, right? Um, and so in, in spite of that, it was still simple. Okay, great. I think that's it. I think we're at two minutes left um, until the end of the session. Yeah, thanks everybody. I hope it was useful and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Oh yeah, one question, sure. How do you really start building the ecosystem? Um, everything starts with your first interaction. I mean, I think, uh, like with any any API product project um, or or any API initiative, uh, it should be API first driven. So you want to start on those initial API first principles. You want that developer, or you want the consumer and that producer to be talking together so they can build something. That conversation in itself is the beginning of an ecosystem play. And that's one. Two, you need to pick something impactful that actually matters. I, I hate going to projects and API initiatives where they've got big ideas. We want to completely transform how we do business. We want to open up to a whole bunch of new markets. And we want to attract new players. But actually, what we want to go do for the next three months is build a Hello World application that no one's going to care about. That is not helping anybody. You, the, your first interactions need to be impactful. So you want to find something that the business is going to care about. And that the business is going to care about because it's going to open them up to new markets. It's going to attract new partners. It's going to, I don't know exactly what it's going to be because it'll be different for each and every organization, but something that will have significant impact on, on an organization, something that will actually impact how people are doing their work today. Do that and couple that with that uh, producer and consumer creating the first contract make that a success and then build on the back of that success so you can do more and more of this. That's how you start an ecosystem. All right, thank you everybody. Um, I hope you guys have a great day. I'll hang out here for a minute, see if there's anything else.
Bye, everybody.